mode. Good morning, afternoon and evening to our audience today. Welcome to the latest webinar hosted by De Device Authority and Cumulosity. My name is Rosa Lenders and I am very pleased to welcome our key speakers for today, Philip Hooker and James Penny. Philip is Director of Strategic Programs at Cumulosity. He was the instigator of one of the innovation initiatives inside Nokia, which became Cumulosity. He has over 20 years experience working for and with the CXOs of global organizations in many sectors, including Orange, Nokia, Barclays, Wipro, and PRS for Music, on numerous strategy, business development, and program delivery topics. James is a technical architect at Device Authority. He has worked in security for over 10 years, architecting and deploying complex security and encryption projects for organizations across all industries, including financial, pharmaceutical, and UK agencies. He has also designed several apps which are featured on the Apple Store. We expect the webinar to last approximately an hour, and you will be able to submit questions via the chat window in the GoToWebinar control panel throughout the session. We will try to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the webinar. Contact details are included in the final slide, so if we are unable to cover your question today, or should a question arise afterwards, please contact us. A recording of the webinar will be made available tomorrow on the Device Authority website, and everyone who registered will be emailed the link. I shall now hand over to our speakers, Philip and James. Thank you, Rosa. So, manufacturing and process industries heavily invest in research and development to both develop products and optimize the process to manufacture them on an industrial scale. With the increasing sophistication of manufacturing techniques, process equipment, and monitoring mechanisms, a growing emphasis has been focused on the intellectual creations. This intellectual property, or IP, can take the form of industrial formulas, manufacturing recipes, computer-aided designs, and advanced machine configurations and are often where a large proportion of a value in manufacturing and process industries now reside. The protection of these assets in life is therefore crucial. So firstly, I'd like to provide a brief introduction to Cumulosity. Cumulosity was born in an innovation initiative inside Nokia which was focused on making carrier grade network management systems applicable to the requirements and economics of the evolving machine to machine market. The organization grew rapidly through its successes and won numerous industry awards before being spun off but still backed in Nokia's 2012 reorganization. Today Nokia serves over 100 enterprise customers using over 1,000 tenants and supports over 2,500 developers around the world. Nokia strives to remove the complexity and cost from IoT and allow the benefits to be exploited rapidly, comprehensively and securely by all organizations. We offer a fully featured Internet of Things platform product which covers 80 to 90% of the requirements of most customers out of the box. The remaining 10 to 20% can be easily developed using our open APIs, plugins and application integration. Our IoT platform is inherently carrier grade for security, reliability and availability and is both device and network agnostic. It can be deployed across 20 global cloud hubs on five continents or on premise in a customer site or as a hybrid of both. Now, no webinar about IoT security would be complete without sharing some more details about the security inherent in our IoT platform. So Cumulosity designed security in from the start with leading edge technologies and techniques employed at every layer in the technology stack. Native multi-tenancy ensures that each organization's data is separated whilst allowing it to run on the same software instance. Device as a client ensures that the Device takes control of its communications and is not accessible by anything other than the platform. Multi-factor authentication is available to provide an additional mechanism to ensure user authenticity. We regularly 
<coughs> are security audited by independent security consultants, with our IT platform passing many industry security benchmarks, including Deutsche Telekom's privacy and security assessment, and are recognized as having higher security than some online banks. At Cumulosity, we feel that the Internet of Things is about partners, and Cumulosity is continuously leveraging and building out its leading partner network. As a horizontal platform provider, we are involved in many vertical markets and continuously bring the ingenious, innovative approaches of one market to another and all the others we're working in. Our IoT platform is white labeled by many partners around the world. We have the devices from many manufacturers pre integrated and open source agents for the most common device platforms. The breadth of our network application systems integrator and independent software vendor partnerships helps us solve the customer's common problem, enterprise digitization. I'd like to now hand over to James Penny to introduce Device Authority. Yes, thank you, Phil. So uh, Device Authority um, is an a IoT security company that provides a, a, an automation platform to help organizations reduce the complexities, the cost, and the time to market for delivering and deploying Internet of Things solutions by providing a secure device-bound authentication and device registration process um, coupled with end-to-end -end encryption solution uh, using out-of-the-box components that are you know, ready to install on these devices and, and, and check those security boxes. So a brief history of device authority. Um, we uh, obviously have spent the last uh, few years um, aligning with strategic uh, partners. Uh, you'll see some big names on, on this, this sort of history chart here. But uh, obviously, there are the likes of the IoT platform providers, such as Cumulosity. Um, and as well, you'll notice the other security vendors along this, this timeline, such as Symantec and DigiCert, who really use uh, the device authority solution to drive greater value around some of their existing PKI implementations. And there's also the big name hardware and chipset manufacturers that, that you can also see here, such as Intel and Dell, who we're working very closely with to, to provide certified security solutions for, for their particular products. So if I just explain sort of the device authority solution sets, um, these are the four sort of pillars and the, the solutions that are delivered as part of the, the security enablement and automation platform that we call uh, device authority key scaler. And these all segue quite nicely into each other. So if we start at the top left, uh, the secure device registration and provisioning, and now this solution really helps you solve the challenge of onboarding devices at first boot um, straight out of that manufacturing plant. So once this device is coming on for the first time, there's kind of a chicken and egg situation around, do I trust a device that is not previously known to these systems? And device authority helps solve that problem by, by creating a um, device-derived registration process uh, that's based on, on sort of whitelisting these devices into your, your ecosystem. And as part of that, the provisioning of these devices to get them configured and set up with the assets and, and credentials that they need to do their jobs properly in the wild. For example, generating uh, PKI certificates and, and getting those delivered down to each device. Now, post-registration, the credential management, moving to the bottom left quadrant here, um, focuses on the management of those assets for the lifetime of that device. So for example, securely storing those credentials, whether it's username and password or a certificate on that device, even in the absence of, of a TPM. Moving on from that, the actual management of that at the time of renewal. So with this solution, it, it is possible to create shorter-lived certificates to reduce that attack surface within your devices 
that they use to, to authenticate to, to third-party platforms. So the solution actually takes care of the, the renewal and the um, reprovisioning of these certificates at renewal time. And also revoking these certificates as well. So when a device within device authority enters a quarantine state, we can actually propagate that information out to your asset um, or sorry, credential providers such as PKI vendors or, or other um, identity systems to revoke those credentials within their systems too. Moving to the top right, the policy-driven encryption solution allows organizations to deliver end-to-end data-centric encryption for the data that's moving between IoT devices and either other IoT devices or the back-end services. So by actually encrypting the, the data itself, instead of just relying on transport layer security, we can actually persist the security around the data regardless of the number of third-party um, ecosystems that that data might move through on its journey. And the fourth in the, in the bottom right here is the secure over-the-air updates, which is our ability to A, encrypt update packages for devices and the option to tie that update to a specific device or subset of devices and then also provide data integrity validation around those updates to make sure they didn't come from a malicious source and make sure you know someone's not trying to apply additional functionality to that device that you didn't intend from from manufacturing time if I just quickly show you this uh, the sort of architecture overview of the device authority key scaler platform so moving from the top you'll see the management control panel this is the administrative interface that that your admins log into to manage the authorization state of their devices provision new devices set up end-to-end -end encryption policies and also um, get a view of the, the security dashboard for logging and auditing and, and security notifications within the environment. That connects down into the device authority engine, which is obviously the brain of the, the sort of entire operation here, which provide the actual device authentication services, the server side authorization and, and policy enforcement, um, management of keys within the entire system, and the uh, again that that credential management functionality that we we actually I meant referenced in the previous slide. There is a software element you can see in the top left here, which lives on the devices typically, and that software element connects into our service access controller, which is a service appropriate for deploying into the DMZ, um, and allows you to facilitate those external connections. And then finally, at the bottom here are service connectors, which are modularized components that allow us to efficiently and quickly integrate with our third-party partners. Okay, Phil. Great. So, so thank you, James. So, um, so what do we consider to be industrial intellectual property? And also, why do we think it should be secured? The recent decades have seen a massive boom in innovation in manufacturing. With the adoption of flexible manufacturing at large volumes in the 1980s, lean techniques in the 1990s, and high penetration of robotics shortly after. And then today, increasingly, semi-autonomous machines are starting to be deployed. These technologies and techniques have radically increased manufacturing efficiency and product quality at the same time as reducing wastage and rework. This results in it being increasingly rare to see a single person in a modern manufacturing plant. These gains have not only been limited to the manufacturers of solid products, with drinks manuf manufacturing processes also taken advantage. Organizations in this area are starting to use sensing technologies to detect the slight variations of the drink ingredients and process operation so they can make micro adjustments to the mixture and ensure greater and more consistent drink quality. 
during all phases of the machine's operation. In the past, process machines have had an extended stabilization period, which this resolves. Also, more recent developments, such as 3D printing, have created new opportunities in manufacturing, but also new challenges to those manufacturing organizations. It has enabled rapid prototyping of mechanical designs, be they product components or manufacturing components, but also significantly reduced the costs to duplicate highly sophisticated product designs. Now, numerous factors are continuously driving the innovation in manufacturing. The continuous necessity to drive efficiency and effectiveness to new levels is increasing the amount of automation in the whole value chain not just on the factory floor. Organizations recognize that costs of manufacturing equipment can only be reduced through volume production and commoditization, with an increasing number of niche specialists appearing to supply the demand. In some instances where logistics costs are so great or local requirements are so broad, an increasing number of smaller local flexible manufacturers are appearing to act as local manufacturers of the designs from larger organizations. This satisfies not only the demand for the original product in that local area, but also the spare parts market, which in some areas could be quite extensive. These trends are creating a fundamental shift in what most manufacturing organizations consider to be their core competence and, a, and its associated value. In essence, manufacturing organizations are increasingly associating greater value to their intellectual property than that of their plant and infrastructure, which historically they've associated as being their greatest value. The intellectual property itself is embedded within many areas of the organization's business, but can, be, but can be most easily seen as sophisticated product and manufacturing equipment designs, production processes, and configurations of the manufacturing plant and infrastructure. So how, how can IoT help? And in particular, how can it help us securely deploy and manage this industrial and intellectual property? So a good analogy to take is with copyright management that's been around for some considerable time. In this concept, there is a creator of the intellectual property and a consumer or user of that material. The intellectual property is, create, is created and would go through an identification and registration process prior to being used and stored for use, with the creator being informed that it is available to be used. The user would then request use of the intellectual property through a licensing process and would be distributed the intellectual property in the appropriate form if the licensing requirements were met, with the creator getting a notification of its use. A number of security techniques are used in this process, with watermarking to ensure identification of the intellectual property, authentication in the licensing process, and possibly encryption in the distribution of the intellectual property itself. Now, in the highly automated, often uh, robotized domain of modern industrial manufacturing, a number of additional actions are required. The user of the intellectual property is often now the end manufacturing machine, robot or milling device, with a new actor of customer who is essentially the factory or plant manager managing the deployment of this intellectual property to their manufacturing machines. As the intellectual property in question is extremely sophisticated, an administrator is often required to manage the usage of the intellectual property on behalf of the creator. The intellectual property creation process happens in the same way. However, the usage process requires some extra steps. With the customer's authorization to use the intellectual pro uh, property possibly requiring confirmation by the administrator. The deployment of the intellectual property um, being direct, uh, directed to the manufacturing plant or equipment uh, user itself, so the robot or manufacturing equipment itself. Automatic usage information being passed directly back 
compared against the license and visible to the administrator. In this situation, the integrity of the information transferred between the intellectual property management system, those middle box, boxes, and the manufacturing plant or equipment is key, with encryption often being essential. So securing the securing of the industrial intellectual property in this manner isn't without its challenges. Firstly, the creation of a secured encrypted channel between the systems holding the intellectual property and the large volume of assets requiring its usage requires a trust relationship to be created between them. How can this done how can this be done and done effectively? Secondly, there are multiple users of the intellectual property and its usage information. How can this information be secured from end to end in a way that not only authorized users have access to the information, <coughs> and only those users have access to information and it's actually readable to them? And as the licensing is likely to require some knowledge of the usage, even if, even if a fee is not directly related to it, how can usage information be brought back from the asset in a way that its accuracy is irrefutable? So I'll quickly hand over to James, James to go through how these problems can be approached. Sure, thank you, Phil. Um, so how do we create the end-to-end -end trust relationship either between devices or from that, that asset creation to the consumption? Well. Firstly, we need to establish and utilize some kind of trust authority. Uh, historically, this has been a certificate authority or a PKI vendor. Um, today, in the, in the demo, uh, we'll be using obviously device authority, can also act as that trust authority. And what it allows you to do is, you know, create that relationship between you through, through that actual higher power that's been through the vetting process and applies to, uh, or, or conforms to certain standards that, that we believe to be um, secure. Second is encrypting that information from end to end. Because even if the, the, the trust is there and you can establish that you are you know, sending information to, to a person, um, that information can ultimately be you know, tampered or, or, or viewed somewhere in the middle. So, Protecting this information from that, that creator um, to the consumer is a vital step in this process. And establishing a, a strong trust anchor at device enrollment, also to, to prevent these unauthorized devices from participating in, in what might be your, you know, your, your privatized um, trusted environment. Uh, the, the idea here is that you can have all the encryption in the world and some of the, the best implementations for, for communicating between the creator and the consumer, but if you're letting any device come in and register as a, as a trusted participant, um, then you're ultimately, it, it undermines the, the entire value of the system. So how do we securely control access to that data? Again, data encryption at rest and in transit. And I, I don't just mean the transport layer stuff here. Again, actually encrypting the message so that you can have cryptographic assurances that your intellectual property wasn't viewed by a malicious individual at any, um, at any point in time. And this becomes especially uh, important when you talk about data at rest because that is probably the, the one of the biggest attack vectors for for this particular kind of information. This is where it's sort of sitting there, it's, it might not be guarded or you might think it's guarded appropriately but there are so many different ways that people can get access to that information once it's sitting there and, and is not being maybe monitored by a process or something like that. So data encryption at rest and in transit to, to give you that assurance. And also a, a sort of a tiered or a granular permissions policy to the actual metadata of that information. I know Phil touched on this on previous slides, uh, but you know, utilizing 
the the for instance the cumulosity granular permission set to to expose certain bits of information about the data that's flowing through the system to perhaps your administrators but ultimately not giving access to absolutely everyone who's who's authenticated within the system because that that helps you define that difference between authenticated and and actually authorized to view that data And lastly, the device, sorry, excuse me, device identity based authorization. So again, asserting the actual identity of the device or the, the, the person that is trying to um, gain access to that data. If you've got the cryptographic assurance and the, the encryption of that data at rest and in transit, and you can rest safe in the knowledge that someone has to sort of authenticate themselves and they must be the, the appropriate owner of that key to, to decrypt it, that gives you a much greater assurance over who's actually accessing that data as opposed to simply um, you know, leaving it in, in clear text. And the final question, how do we ensure irrefutable evidence from source? Well, there is an obvious strategy here, and that is data signatures and, and data integrity validation. So using cryptographic techniques and keys, we can obviously create um, these signatures that provide a mathematical proof that data was signed with a specific private key. And you can verify the integrity of that data and the integrity of the signature based on either having the public key or being able to compute that that, um, for instance, hash message authentication code for certain data sets yourself, which is, which is great and it obviously sets the backbone for what we're talking about here, but you also need key ownership assurance. And what this means is having the, uh, the relationship between the device and the certificate or the key, the private key or, or whatever might be used, um, and creating that uh, stronger binding between that key material and that device because at the end of the day the, the key actually verifies that someone had ownership of that key to sign the data but doesn't necessarily tie itself to the device so you know either through a, 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 a TPM or the device authority device bound key provisioning um, you need to really create that strong relationship between the, the key material itself and the devices to, to create that key ownership assurance. And finally, that, that having that identity as well tied back into the centralized system to allow you to look at security notifications, um, logging and auditing trails to say, yes, device one created this data, it was present, it authenticated itself at encryption time, um, we were able to assert the identity of it, then it sent the information, and at the receiving end, being able to say, yep, you are definitely device two, you are authorized to access this information, and you know, have the have appropriate permissions to, to, to consume it, and, and creating that, those, those security notifications and events, and that breadcrumb trail of, of all the actions for um, this particular sensitive information. Great, thank you, thank you, James. So, as you've seen, security needs to be considered at each layer in the technology stack. The combination of cumulosity and device authority comprehensively tackles security at each layer. With every layer up to include the application layer, the security is provided by cumulosity and our hosting partner, be that Amazon, Microsoft, or an organization's own IT department for our on-premises deployment and the comprehensive end-to-end -end security service is provided by device authority. So how would, a, or how should, or would a solution look like in real life? So for example, Acme Manufacturing would like to connect its manufacturing machines. To do this, it could use Cumulosity's IoT platform to rapidly connect the assets, manage the data, and extend the workflows across the two. When we want to start transferring business critical intellectual property, 
we would also want to consider the usage of device authorities IoT security platform. This can provide the end-to-end -end encryption from inside the Acme manufacturing IoT systems to inside the recipient asset with the transferred data unreadable to all part, at all parts in between including on the Cumulosity IoT platform. In fact, the end-to-end -end encrypt encrypted data is only usable on the Cumulosity IoT platform if it is deciphered on the fly for authorized users. And at this point, I'd like to hand back to James. Yes, thank you, Phil. Um, I believe we should be clear. So I'm going to present uh, an example of the device authority and the cumulosity integration here. Um, just to preempt this and, and set up the scene for what I will be showing you and, and talking about, we got an example problem statement. So this is very aligned to, to what Phil has already um, discussed very well in his, in his previous slides. Um, so we have a connected manufacturing device that's deployed into a facility that's either in a remote location or is owned by a third party. And, and that manufacturing device periodically receives new data from the research and development department or uh, whoever's coming up with these prototypes to, to deploy down to that device, have this rapid prototype created and, and you know, tested in the real world. So to ensure the security of this, uh, this either CAD files or whatever we might be sending down, um, we're going to provide end-to-end -end data encryption between the creation process and the consumption process that, that Phil detailed. And as part of that, we're going to authenticate to the device authority platform both um, participants within this particular end-to-end uh, -end encryption demo. Um, and we're going to also then show the, the devices receiving appropriate permissions and being able to decrypt that data and then subsequently send back the, the acknowledgement of data consumption back to the original sending party. So we're going to show the, the first server which is typically deployed within the internal network. Um, this has got a device authority agent sitting on it and it's going to encrypt the data at source. Um, and then deliver it up to the Cumulosity platform. Then we're going to notify the endpoint device that it has a new file and um, tell it to download that file, decrypt it, and process it accordingly. Uh, as part of that decrypting process, again, that end-to-end, -end, that, sorry, that device um, at that manufacturing plant will authenticate itself and, and decrypt the file based on its permissions and then send back an encrypted acknowledgement back to the Cumulosity platform, which will be sent on to the original sending party. So what this actually looks like from, a, from an overview perspective is we have Acme Manufacturing, again, on the, on the left-hand side of the diagram that, that Phil's already spoken to. Um, we're gonna authenticate that, that server. That's when the encryption takes place. We'll encrypt that data, send it to Cumulosity, it will then sit in Cumulosity's file repository in an encrypted state. The end device will be notified that that file is there. The device will download that, that data, authenticate itself, gain authorization to consume that file, and then decrypt it and use it. For some reason I can't seem to see my cursor here. There we go, that's what I wanted. Apologies for that. So we have these two devices that are um, already registered within the device authority platform. You'll see it's called a Cumulosity device appropriately and Cumulosity encryption service. The Cumulosity encryption service is at the Acme Manufacturing. This is the server that lives within the R&D department that's responsible for encrypting the files. And the Cumulosity device is at the manufacturer site and will be responsible for consuming and decrypting these files. If we take a look inside Cumulosity's platform, you'll see there are no files currently in the file repository. That's ultimately where our encrypted file will end up. And we're going to utilize the events API to broker that um, new file notification 
as well as the file consumption acknowledgement. So if we go to the endpoint device, so this is the device connected inside the manufacturing space. On here we're going to start the device authority and cumulosity agent and this will um, put, place it into an authorized state and it's now ready to receive these files from that cumulosity platform. And then if we move to the Acme manufacturing plant, so we're going to start a service that will automatically pick up files that are being placed onto the server. It will encrypt those files and then send them to Cumulosity. You'll see here it's monitoring the slash root slash upload directory for new files. And here I have a, a file connection or an SFTP connection to that particular server. So this is our example data. This is a JSON packet um, which contains some information to be delivered down to that, that device. So I'm at Acme Manufacturing. I placed my new prototype or, or mix onto that server. And you'll see here that the, the device authority agent and the Cumulosity agent found the new file. It's called data.json. It authenticates the server to derive an appropriate crypto key using the device authorities uh, device derived crypto. It successfully finished the encryption. It then automatically uploaded that file to the Cumulosity file repository and then generated an event notification for that endpoint device um, telling it that there's a new file available. So on the endpoint device this receives a notification of a, of a new encrypted file and you'll see that it, it downloaded the file from, from the Cumulosity platform and then it authenticated the device it authorized it, it got authorization. There is a, a, a policy that says that this device is allowed to decrypt files that are coming from that specific Acme manufacturing um, R&D department. And it successfully finished the decryption process. After that, it generates a, um, a file consumption notification, which it in turn has encrypted itself and sent that back to the Cumulosity platform. And if we take a look on the actual file system of that device, we can see our original data.json that was, that was placed um, on the server at the Acme Manufacturing um, internal network. So then here, back at the Acme Manufacturing um, facility, uh, we can see that it received an encrypted notification from that device. So this is our irrefutable evidence that the device has taken that data, it's decrypted it, and it's managed to place it into its into its factory process. And you'll see the uh, it came through as an encrypted notification. And again, this. Um, this particular server has authority and permissions to decrypt information coming from that device. So it's authenticated itself, it's decrypted it, and it, the message ultimately ended up saying Cumulosity device, the file data.json.enc was consumed one time. And if we go to the Cumulosity platform, we can see evidence of, of this entire trail. So you'll see we have two notifications now. So the first notification was a, a notification for the endpoint device to say that there is a new encrypted file available. This contains the file name and the URL where it can download it. And the second notification was that data consumption acknowledgement. So this is, as you can see, it's, it's ciphertext. Um, this is the information that says, yep, I was this device and I successfully consumed that data as part of my, my process. And if we take a look inside the file repository, you'll see we have our new data.json.enc. No prizes for guessing what ENC stands for. Um, and if we open that and take a look, this is the file as it sits within Cumulosity as you can see, it's all ciphertext, means nothing to anyone, unless you are an authenticated and authorized device within that platform.
Okay. So I'm back to Rosa. Thanks, James, um, and thanks, Phil. Um, so, yeah, this is just a chance for everyone. If you haven't submitted your question already, this is just your chance to submit any questions you have for Phil or for James. Um, I've been monitoring a couple of questions that have already been raised uh, throughout the webinar, so I'll just come and ans ask you some now. Um, so obviously we've been we've been speaking here about um, you know an industrial use case, but actually um, some of the audience are asking um, you know what other scenarios would you use this joint um, device authority and cumulosity solution? So, so James, maybe maybe if I start, so um, yeah, sure. <clears throat> from from cumulosity's point of view, we're seeing a, a number of use cases come up that require. Um, this uh, this ele well, both, both elements so um, the the encrypted data download but also the irrefutable evidence. Um, one of these is uh, that was recently raised to me uh, was regarding um, car crashes. So there's a, a large number of uh, cameras now in cars, especially in um, uh, large vehicle fleets, uh, and this this capability to actually encrypt the data that actually comes back from those cameras uh, when there is a crash. And there's a, not, there's a large number of some companies around around Europe who are actually um, sort of streaming the data. Uh, when they detect a crash in the car, an accident in the car, they send the data back before there's a terminal fault, uh, obviously for fire, etc., uh, in that vehicle. Uh, and that's used to determine uh, the, the cause of the incident, who's actually um, at fault, uh, and many other things. So the, the I suppose the legal premises having that irrefutable evidence that it, it did come from that. Uh, that source. Uh, it couldn't have been tampered with prior to being used uh, in a court or through legal proceedings. It's extremely valuable. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a, um, a very good um, and prominent use case that, uh, that I would, I mean, echo the sentiments for. Obviously, with the announcement recently that Tesla is going to be providing all this auto driving hardware as well, there's an increased requirement for security. Um, especially in vehicle to vehicle and, and vehicle to to infrastructure um, deployments and um, the the user based insurance is another really uh, really good example of that you know the insurance a car is a car but your your insurance is kind of what ties the user down to that specific device and once the user becomes involved you know that that's uh, obviously becomes a, a case for regulatory um, Action and, and compliance. So, um, yeah, I think that's a it's a really good example. Okay, thanks. I've just got um, another two questions here, which kind of go hand in hand. So, um, obviously, quite interested in um, the joint solution. So, firstly, they're just asking, you know, what you've just demoed. Obviously, is you know, is that available, um, ready to to deploy as such today? Yes, yeah. So, so what I've actually shown here, and the the device authority agents that were deployed to those particular devices are are freely available. Um, you know, it's interacting with the Cumulosity API. They have a great set of of developer instructions. Um, but uh, yeah, this is absolutely available uh, available today. No no problem. Um, and then, sort of following on from that, is just whether. Um, so someone's sort of picked up on James the fact that you you went through the um, the whole of the sort of the key scalar solutions. Um, so obviously the the demo focused very much on sort of the encryption and authentication. Um, but will the will the remaining solutions sort of looking at the certificates um, will that eventually be available as well through Cumulosity? Yes, I mean, I mean, so all of the solutions that we discussed are, I mean, are available today, and you know, encourage anyone to who wishes to learn anything more about them, either from a technical standpoint or an implementation standpoint, to to reach out. Um, but absolutely, I mean, this is these those are our, our cornerstone of the key scaler product. Um, the the actual press release for which I think was. Um, a couple of weeks ago, that we we actually announced it, and and that was our that was our announcement of the availability of those solutions. So so 
Um, you know, they're, they're, the technology is all there, the products are all there today. Um, so absolutely, I mean, if, if there are any, um, if there is anyone that wants to discuss them offline, then, then please feel free to, to reach out. Okay, and is, is, that, is that also in, in joint with, I think what they're asking is if they are already a, a Cumulosity um, user, if they're, already a Cumulosity, if they're already using the Cumulosity platform for their IoT projects. Um, yes, absolutely. So, okay. so there, there, there will obviously be a, a, an undertaking of trying to understand exactly what they might be using the Cumulosity platform for. You know, no use cases are typically alike, but the for the bulk of the the, the groundwork and and the device authority solution gets you that ninety percent of the way to, as I mentioned before, really reduce those complexities. So, um, uh, absolutely, um, yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, maybe also to add from a Cumulosity perspective. So, so Cumulosity has a, a philosophy to have kind of open, publicly available documentation. Uh, so, so we uh, we're um, evolving that in partnership with Device Authority and on the integration side, and actually how we can have uh, things work and also sort of show uh, some of the things we're doing behind the scenes to make this so this integration and this um, this facility uh, uh, even better. Um, so, so that documentation will be available uh, relatively shortly. So, please um, uh, look at both the Device Authority, but also the Cumulosity Developer Center for more information about in the coming days. Great, thank you, Phil, and thank you, James, for asking answering those questions as well. Um, any questions we have not been able to answer, we will answer individually later this week. Um, we've now actually come to the end of the webinar. So a big thank you to Phil and James, um, and actually thank you to everyone for their time and their interest, um, and we look forward to speaking to you.